We're going to pause now to hear from one of our great sponsors on this week's show, the Baptist Joint Committee and their podcast, Respecting Religion. As a listener of Amicus, you know that the Supreme Court is slowly eroding the wall between church and state brick by brick. What you may not know is how a Baptist group fights for both religion clauses of the First Amendment, protecting that wall of separation. The Respecting Religion podcast is hosted by Amanda Tyler and Holly Holman, two Baptist advocates and constitutional attorneys. If you are worried about Christian nationalism, authoritarian theocracy, and the misuse of the term, quote, religious freedom to harm others, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Jason Palmer, one of the hosts of The Intelligence, The Economist's daily current affairs podcast. The Economist's award-winning shows make sense of what matters, from our special series on China's president to our weekly podcasts on business, technology, and American politics. Our journalists provide fair, in-depth reporting on the events shaping the world. To get the annual plan for less than $2.50 per month, search for Economist Podcasts Plus to start listening today. We have to learn from the past. The one thing that we must learn is that when people get away with violating the rule of law, it's not as if they learn their lesson. It seems to me that it encourages them to act with further impunity. Hi, and welcome back to Amicus. This is Slate's podcast about the courts and the law and the Supreme Court and the rule of law in a constitutional democracy. I am Dahlia Lithwick. That's my beat at Slate. Former President Donald J. Trump has delivered an unwelcome package of text and history and political violence to the Supreme Court. And next Thursday, the justices are going to have to unbox it and contend with it. Trump v. Anderson, also known as the Colorado ballot case or the Section 3 of the 14th Amendment Disqualification Clause case, is one that we have talked about a good bit on this show. Over the last couple of months, we've wondered about whether this case is the best vehicle for defeating Trump. We have fretted about how the case might unleash chaos and even violence in states where angry voters will come to say they were disenfranchised if he's taken off the ballot. And we've also talked about what it means for the U.S. Supreme Court to be deciding such a monumental political case, one that could, in fact, determine the outcome of the 2024 election, all while the court's own approval ratings are kind of in the toilet. We actually haven't talked much about the constitutional law of this case or about the actual historical context behind it. And there is, as it turns out, a very deep bench of people who also worry about some of those things I just mentioned worrying about, but who really want the court and the public to understand Section 3, that little-known, mostly overlooked, rarely deployed section of the Reconstruction Amendments. They want us to know what it was intended to do and why it applies right now. These people are the Civil War scholars who have dedicated years to the study of Reconstruction. And these historians are out in force ahead of oral arguments with amicus briefs that are just full of a rich understanding of the text and the history that the originalists at the courts say they are desperate to understand. We are going to have one of the authors of a really great historian's brief on the show this week to make the case that Section 3 of the 14th Amendment was, in fact, written for precisely this moment. Later on in the show, my jurisprudential co-pilot, Mark Joseph Stern, is going to drop into the Slate Plus Members Only After Party right here on Amicus to talk about a Pennsylvania Supreme Court ruling on abortion that actually took both the text and history and human rights around the Equal Protection Clause and abortion protections seriously. We're also going to talk about a bonkers decision out of the full Eighth Circuit Court of Appeals that could actually put a stake in the heart of what remains of the Voting Rights Act. 
That conversation is only available to Slate Plus members. And if you are not a member yet, but you would like to listen in to ad free versions of all of Slate's podcasts and access bonus segments like our Amicus Plus conversations and exclusive extras from shows like Slow Burn and Political Gab Fest. And if you would like to enjoy unlimited reading on Slate.com, head to Slate.com slash Amicus Plus for more details. Slate.com slash Amicus Plus. And as we always tell our loyal Slate Plus members, thank you for supporting the work we do here at the magazine. But first, when a violent mob stormed the Capitol on January 6th of 2021, most of us looked on with frozen horror. The minds of Civil War historians almost immediately leapt to the 14th Amendment. Ratified in 1868, it is best known for providing meaningful citizenship and equal protection to formerly enslaved and free Black people. But within its text, there is a lesser-known provision designed to bar former Confederates from holding public office during Reconstruction. And while the history is not well known to the majority of us, and you could, as many of us did, graduate from law school without having thought much about it at all— Section 3 is what the Colorado case hangs on, and it is very well known to the historians who have signed amicus briefs laying all this out. Professor Manisha Sinha is one of 25 historians who signed on to one such brief. Her work is also cited in a second amicus brief from another group of eminent historians, including Jill Lepore. Professor Sinha is the James L. and Shirley A. Draper Chair in American History at the University of Connecticut and President-Elect of the Society for Historians of the Early American Republic. She is also the author of The Counter-Revolution of Slavery, Politics and Ideology in Antebellum, South Carolina. Her new book, The Rise and Fall of the Second American Republic, Reconstruction, 1860-1920, is forthcoming this March from Live Right, W.W. Norton. Manisha, I want to welcome you to the podcast. It occurs to me more and more that in advance of next week's historic argument, every American probably wishes that they had a little pocket historian to help them unpack Section 3. Thank you, Dahlia, for having me and for that very generous introduction. Happy to be here. So there's a way... We're going to start at the at the big stuff, but there's a way in which it feels like this Section 3 case presents the court with what feels like a kind of natural experiment in originalism and originalist methodology, right? We've got a kind of obscure constitutional provision. It's on balance not seen a ton of application in the courts. There's no decades of doctrine. There's not think tanks working a way to interpret it. There's just kind of text in history and a bunch of scholars who know what it means. This feels like it's almost a pure test of how the court's dedication to originalism and taking history seriously could work in a vacuum, yeah? Yes. You know, uh, if you look at these Reconstruction constitutional amendments, especially the 14th Amendment, we find that the court and generally conservatives in courts who believe in originalism, that's where they decide not to use originalist doctrine when it comes to Reconstruction amendments. They do use it for the original Constitution, the original 10 amendments. Usually a bit of a <laughs> little bit of wiggle room there, but uh, but when it comes to something as important and crucial as the Fourteenth Amendment, the Supreme Court of the United States, in particular, has a history of either completely misinterpreted misinterpreting it, or actually literally overthrowing it. So all the protections in the Fourteenth Amendment that were there for former slaves, they used it to protect corporations through much of American history. It's only in recent times that the equal protection clause of the 14th Amendment that is so important for our rights as citizens and for our democracy today has been used to extend rights. Um, In Roe v. Wade, well, of course, now that's gone by the roadside, uh, and also in, you know, gay marriage and other ways in which the 14th Amendment writers thought of the Equal Protection Clause, they actually said this in Congress. They said, we hope that future generations will use this clause for broader protections. Um, If the 14th Amendment is implemented in all its sections, 
we really would be able to fix our democracy and some of the problems that we have seen recently. And in particular, the anti-insurrection clause of Section 3 is, I think, crucial. It's a sleeping giant. And we really, uh, as historians, but also as citizens who are concerned about the future of democracy, should think about implementing Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. So I'm going to just start with this very lawyerly request to remind us what Section 3 says. Yes. So Section 3 basically says, and I'm paraphrasing here, that if you have sworn an oath of office to the United States Constitution, which all federal officials have to do, including the president of the United States, and then committed or incited insurrection against the government of the United States, you are barred from holding office in the United States government unless there is an amnesty law passed by two-thirds of both houses of Congress that pardons you. So there is a way out. And many Confederates actually succeeded in getting that amnesty, unfortunately, in my opinion. So there is a way out, but that is a clear disqualification. It does not say that you have to be tried. It does not say you have to be impeached. It's a qualification to hold office under the United States government. If you have committed insurrection against the government of the United States and sworn to uphold the U.S. Constitution, then you are barred from holding office under it, which is a pretty mild, you know, right. disqualification. It's not a criminal penalty. Yeah, it's, it's not just saying, dead for treason. <laughs> you don't get this job. Exactly. You have violated your oath of office to the United States Constitution, and therefore you're ineligible to ever hold office unless you get an amnesty, a pardon. Manisha, I'm going to ask you to talk to me like I'm one of your undergraduate history students because I think we have such a a shallow, if it exists at all, understanding of what was happening at the time that the Reconstruction Amendments were drafted. So I want you to quite literally tell me when is the time period when we're talking about Reconstruction, what was going on, and, and maybe just help us through the eyes of the drafters of these amendments, what was the sort of exigent problem they were trying to solve? Right. You know, if you look at this period, the period of the Civil War from 1860 to 1865, and then the period after that, the immediate aftermath of the Civil War, right up to the 1870s, and I would even go up to the 1890s, when Black people are formally disfranchised in the Southern states, and you have Plessy versus Ferguson and Jim Crow in the South. If you look at this entire period, it's a period of political and constitutional crisis. And of course, it's brought on by the secession of most of the slave states, by the war itself. So the Congress at that time, the 39th Congress, which is an amazing Congress because they do such incredible things, including passing the first federal civil rights acts, they have the problem of rewriting the United States Constitution to redefine citizenship, mainly because you have 4 million enslaved people who have been freed. And what would be their status in a republic? Would you keep them as second-class citizens, as there were actually many free blacks in the northern states, except for certain states in New England that gave black men the right to vote? They did not even have the right to vote. So this was a real question, a testing point in the country's democracy to think about it. And in my opinion, Lincoln is really the first Reconstruction president because he, of course, supports the passage of the 13th Amendment that makes emancipation irreversible. But even more important than the 13th Amendment is the 14th Amendment, which is passed in 1868. It literally rewrites the U.S. Constitution in a sense because it establishes national birthright citizenship. People may have heard about that. There were some people who will remain nameless, who thought they could just simply get rid of it by an executive order. But, you know, you can't do that with a constitutional amendment. You have to amend the Constitution to get rid of another constitutional amendment. So the 14th Amendment is so important because it establishes these two very bedrock principles of our modern democracy in the United States. National birthright citizenship and equal protection under the laws. And interestingly, it uses the term persons. 
It doesn't use male, female, black, white, nothing. It says, you know, all disabilities, according to race and previous condition of servitude, are done away with, that everyone is a citizen of the American Republic. And this is such an important idea. Then, of course, they had to enforce this because there were many Confederates in the South that were in a state of full rebellion still, even after they had been defeated in the Civil War. They did not accept their defeat or the results of the Civil War, which was emancipation and a modicum, at least, of civil rights for Black people. Instead, they're trying to reinstate slavery in different guises. They pass black codes. They launch a program of racist domestic terror that attacks not just African Americans, but federal officials, Republicans. At that time, the Republican Party was the party of Lincoln, anti-slavery, racial liberalism, quote, big government. The Democratic Party was the party of the South, of states' rights. So they have a full-fledged program to undo the results of the Civil War. And so the 14th Amendment is really passed to guard the consequences of the Civil War and to solve this constitutional crisis. And that is how the Section 3 comes into being. Many Confederate high officials like Jefferson Davis, president of the Confederacy and others, had held high office under the United States government. Davis was Secretary of State before the Civil War. They wanted to make sure that these people who were actually part of the federal government and had sworn an oath of office to the United States Constitution should forever be barred. There was others in Congress who wanted a stricter rule. They wanted to disfranchise those people, take away the right to vote, but they didn't do that. As Thaddeus Stevens said, never has treason felt the hand of law more mildly. They said, we will just not let you hold office. And then they even gave them a way out, saying if Congress passes a law by two-thirds majority to amnesty you, then you can stand for office again. So there's a way out also. And in fact, in 1872, Congress did pass a general amnesty law for most ex-Confederates. And that was unfortunate, in my opinion. They thought they would pacify this group of people, and in fact, they did not. These people were actually emboldened, and their campaign of domestic terror escalated And through sheer violence and brutality, they overthrew the Reconstruction state governments in the South, came back into power, established Jim Crow and a regime of racial apartheid in the South that really undid emancipation and black rights right up to the civil rights movement. So we historians who know this history are alarmed at the idea that anyone who does incite or commit insurrection, whether major, as in the Civil War, or minor, as in the case of January 6th. It doesn't seem so minor. I remember watching it in my television screen. And even as a historian of that period, I was shocked that it even happened. If we have to learn from the past, the one thing that we must learn is that when people get away with violating the rule of law, it's not as if they learn their lesson. It seems to me that it encourages them to act with further impunity. So I I just want to hone in on something you said right toward the end there, because I think when we look at some of the revisionist history that's now being applied to Section 3, there's some commentary that says, oh, you know, the 14th Amendment was passed to bring the country back together, right? We wanted to paper over painful wounds. And what you just said about the amnesty is really important, right? Because we actually, again, have a natural experiment in what happens when you say, okay, we're going to paper over the wounds, right? We're going to make it go away. And what happened as a consequence of that is that all these former Confederates then get into office. And no, they don't say, let's paper over the wounds. They just reinstantiate slavery in different forms, right? So, so. This is a kind of cautionary tale about reading the 14th Amendment, particularly Section 3, as something that's going to make us all just get along. 
Exactly. And in fact, when the 14th Amendment was passed, Southerners were outraged. They didn't want to accept it. They didn't want to accept the idea of national citizenship without regard to race and previous condition of servitude. And so, in fact, they didn't see it as a reconciliation measure. But the federal government and Congress were quite clear that if you wanted to rejoin the Union, and that was what Reconstruction was all about, you had to pass the 14th Amendment. And in fact, they did. And there were some northern states like California that refused to pass the 14th Amendment because they didn't want to enfranchise Chinese Americans. So the 14th Amendment is a broadly egalitarian measure that really is is something that would have changed the complexion of Southern society. And unfortunately, it does not. And the idea was, okay, we'll give them amnesty. And at 1872, when they're debating this, there's a civil rights bill in Congress proposed by a radical Republican from Massachusetts, Charles Sumner, one of my heroes from that period. And the idea was that, okay, we'll give them amnesty and they will accept Sumner's civil rights bill that actually outlawed segregation before the Southern states had formally instituted it. Now, unfortunately, of course, the Supreme Court, that plays a pretty bad role with Reconstruction laws and amendments, uh, eventually declares the 1875 Civil Rights Act of Sumner unconstitutional in the civil rights cases of 1883. It was pretty much what the Civil Rights Act of 1964 said. I mean, that was how far ahead it was. So Southerners take that amnesty, but they don't accept the Civil Rights Act. They keep um, opposing it. Uh, They actually take away the right to vote by the 1890s. Southern states have rewritten their constitution to take away the right to vote. And there's another part of the 14th Amendment that has never been enforced and that I actually think should be enforced today. And that is a section that says, if you take away the right to vote from any group of citizens, that's voter suppression, by any trickery or mechanism, right, you would suffer loss of representation in Congress. Now, the southern states should have suffered a loss of representation in Congress because of voter suppression. These were all checks and balances put into place by the originators of the 14th Amendment who really had a capacious understanding of rights. Its main author, John Bigham from Ohio, is the guy who dubbed the first eight amendments the U.S. Constitution Bill of Rights. We all call it Bill of Rights. This guy is the one who, while thinking about the 14th Amendment, did that. So he's really thinking about rights in a very broad way. And, you know, unfortunately, that part of the 14th Amendment that penalizes states for voter suppression, we could use that today. I was going to say. If we had the guts to yeah, do it. Yeah. Um, but we've never implemented it. We're going to take a quick break to hear from some of our sponsors on this week's show. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. Around New Year's, we tend to get really obsessive about how to change ourselves instead of just expanding on the things that we've already done kind of right. Therapy can help you find your strengths so you can ditch the extreme resolutions and start to make changes in your life that really stick. Starting therapy has helped so many people I know feel a little bit less alone and a little bit less confused in this world. If you're thinking of starting therapy, why not give BetterHelp a try? It is entirely online. You just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Celebrate the progress that you have already made. Visit BetterHelp.com slash amicus today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash amicus. And we're going to pause to hear from our friends at NetSuite who are kindly sponsoring this show. Your business was humming, but now you're falling behind. Teams are buried in manual work. It's taking forever to close the books. Getting one source of truth is like pulling teeth. If this is you, you should know these three numbers. 36,000, 25, 1. 36,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25, 
NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One, because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your KPIs in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins, everything you need, all in one place. Right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash amicus. That's netsuite.com slash amicus to get your own KPI checklist, netsuite.com slash amicus. We are back now with Professor Manisha Sinha with everything you ever wanted to know about the text and history of Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, but we're afraid to ask. Manisha, can you talk for a minute about the ways in which Section 3 is just a ghost? I mean, it's invoked so little. There's one of the things that's so weird about reading the briefs in this case, is there's just not a lot of, other than the material you're working with that tries to understand the intent. Right. But there's not a lot of case law. The case law that exists is kind of sketchy and in one case, which we'll get to, bad. So it just goes away. How how many times has Section 3 after the Civil War really been invoked? You know, I think that's a good thing. It's a good thing that we don't have much case law regarding insurrection against the United States government because it hasn't happened that much, right? right? Um, And once these people were amnestied, that, as I said, that clause remains as a sleeping giant for future crises of democracy, for future constitutional crises, as I think we are confronting today. Um, And I'm glad that we haven't had cases of mass insurrection against the United States government. But when, as you mentioned earlier in your introduction, January 6th took place, all of us historians immediately thought of the Reconstruction laws and amendments because that's the only precedent we have from the mid-19th century on this. And then that precedent also gets kind of shortened because all Confederates receive a blanket amnesty. First, Andrew Johnson, arguably the one of the worst presidents in United States history, personally pardons uh, many Confederates. But then the law by Congress then par- pardons everyone, you know, all Confederates who are taken part. And instead of accepting that pardon and being remorseful <laughs> and accepting new citizenship rights, they go and join the Ku Klux Klan. They join the white line, liners, the white leaguers, the Knights of White Camellia. These terrorist groups of ex-Confederates abound, and they're led by Confederate generals. So it's real guerrilla warfare. Uh, so the insurrection really doesn't end. Um, and that's what historians thought about when they saw January 6th. They thought, oh, the enforcement acts that Grant used against the Ku Klux Klan. Oh, the 14th Amendment disqualification. This would disqualify... Trump from ever holding office or ever even running for the presidency because he's an officer of the United States government. Albeit the president, he's still an officer of the United States government. And Section 3 was clearly meant to apply to people like Jefferson Davis, like Alexander Stevens, uh, who's pardoned and then gets reelected. So so you've just actually got to the nut of where I think the historian's brief, you know, fills out what this case, this Colorado case is really about, because there's a bunch of sort of technical legal issues, questions about whether Trump got enough due process in the Colorado context, whether this attack on the Capitol was really, quote unquote, an insurrection. There's a whole bunch of things that the court could do without getting to sort of the nut of the issues that the historians raise. Sean Wilentz does a pretty masterful job uh, in the New York Review of Books, sort of knocking down those arguments. But the 
historical arguments, at least in your brief, center around, I think, two kind of buckets of questions. One is the one you were just starting to talk about, whether Section 3 covers the president when it talks about a quote-unquote officer. The other is whether it requires enabling legislation by Congress uh, in order to be in effect. So can we start with number one, which is where you just ended? The historian's best response to this question of whether the presidency is contemplated as a quote, an office in Section 3? Yes. uh, Most historians, I mean, I would say nearly all historians who study the period, agree that Section 3 covers the presidency, the vice presidency, uh, that was meant to cover them, especially because the treason trial against Jefferson Davis had failed. You know, the government just decided not to prosecute it for various reasons, and it just sort of disappeared. Some historians argued because they thought they were nervous that Davis would be able to claim secession as a constitutional right, uh, which is what many Southern secessionists claimed. And I don't think that's correct. I think the reason why they let it go is political. Many people, especially Salmon Chase, who used to be a radical and became the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, is very eager to run for the presidency. In those days, we don't have that strict separation that we do now, or at least we hope we do. Uh, We've noticed that that doesn't work all the time. Between politics and your constitution as an independent judiciary, your independence as the Supreme Court and as Supreme Court judges. In those days, many Supreme Court judges actually ran for the presidency. And Chase was very interested in getting the Democratic nomination. So there were all kinds of political calculations that that trial had failed. By 1868, it's quite clear that many of these prominent Confederates those who had held office as cabinet officers, those who had held office as high military personnel and had defected to the Confederacy, that there was no punishment coming for them. And I think Section 3 was meant to address that. It was not disfranchising them, which is generous. In most other countries, they would have lost their heads, right? right? You think of the French Revolution and right. other places. They are actually you know, for all the whining coming from the South at that time that this is punitive, it's too strict. In fact, these were generous terms. And maybe reconciliation was the back of people's mind because they were reconstructing the Union. But they did not want to reconstruct the Union on the terms of slaveholders. They had just fought a bloody war in which more Americans died than the Vietnam-Korean War, two world wars combined. And they were not going to have the union reconstructed on their terms. So I think Section 3 was meant to visualize a country where slavery was gone, where everyone, regardless of race and previous condition of servitude, is a citizen, and where people who had committed treason will be barred from holding office because they had violated their oath to the U.S. Constitution. Now, in my view... Those were very generous terms, but Southerners didn't like that. They did not like that. They fought for amnesty, and eventually they even get amnesty. But it definitely covered the president of the United States uh, or any office holder. The president takes an oath of office to the U.S. Constitution. Section 3 is very clear about that. So if you have taken an oath to the U.S. Constitution at any level, from presidency to any other federal official, and committed insurrection, you will be disqualified. And in that sense, we historians and and many expert legal minds, too, on this, and not just liberals, but some conservative judges, too, who take originalism seriously, um, have argued that it is self-executing, that you don't need a law, you don't need a trial, you don't need a punishment. I think it sounds kind of nice to say, oh, someone's denied the due process of law, which is also in the 14th Amendment, by the way, right? right? It nationalizes that idea. It sounds nice, but actually in this issue in particular, it's irrelevant. And am I right um, in reading the briefs on the Trump side that the argument that they level when they say, oh, the president is not an officer, and to be clear, that's what the lower court found. That was the basis from which the lower court in Colorado was like, oh, you know, it was an insurrection. He did it, but he's not an officer as contemplated under Section 3. But the sort of bulk of the historical evidence of that is a statement that was made in debates. One of the the people who then actually was like, oh, I understand 
understand I was wrong about this. Like, it, officer, in fact, does include the president. So it's not even great history, right? Yeah, it's not great history. And I think the Trump defense stems from this very dangerous idea that the president is above the law. Right. The president is not a monarch. We do not have a monarchy. We are a republic. The king can do no wrong. That just simply is not true in the American Republic. And so the Trump defense, I think, revolves around the idea of executive impunity from any action under the law. And Trump himself kind of boasts about this idea, you know, I can shoot someone dead in the streets of New York and my followers will still vote for me. And I think those ideas, as Lincoln warned, actually, in a very prescient speech that he made, are very dangerous in a constitutional government, in a government that upholds the rule of law, in a government based on Republican governance with a small r. And it's worth saying those are the arguments that are being advanced in the you know immunity case that is uh, we're still waiting for the D.C. Circuit to hand down, but they, 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 they ring in the same key. The other piece of this that you tackle in the brief and that I think – gets kind of chummed up with a lot of bad history is the other thing you were talking about, which is do we need implementing legislation or is it um, is that unnecessary? And again, I think this hangs on one decision made by Chief Justice Salmon Chase in Henry Griffin in 1869. It was not a Supreme Court decision. He was kind of gone rogue. And that is the one piece of evidence that the other side has that we need implementing legislation. Is that correct? This is a a sort of known to be a kind of outlier, crazy one-off? Right. I mean, Chase did a lot of strange things. (laughs) As I said, he is politically extremely ambitious. You know, he was Secretary of Treasury during the Civil War. He decides he has presidential ambitions. And Lincoln thinks, I'll appoint him to the Supreme Court, and there he'll be out of trouble. And it doesn't happen. And so he does a lot of uh, really strange things, especially the way he presides over the impeachment of Andrew Johnson is very strange, the way he drags that on. And in in his decision, writing circuit, right, which is like going rogue. But like (laughs) in those days, Supreme Court justices wrote circuit. And they slept Uh, in barns and sometimes shared beds with other people. Writing right. circuit, we should we should we should, we should think about it. But okay, Sam and oh, Chase. Well. <laughs> I don't know. Now they have, uh, what, these campers that they can <laughs> right, right. go it's in. It's the new writing right. circuit. Right, and I, I don't want them to write circuit <laughs> because who knows what's gonna, who's going to buy them what and, and <laughs> keep them wherever. So I don't think that decision is at all pertinent because it goes against the plain wording of Section 3 which is self-executing. The only legislation that Section 3 contemplates, and that's the way out for Trump. Is the amnesty. Is the amnesty. Win both houses of Congress, get a two-thirds majority of Republicans, and get an amnesty law passed for you. That's the way a democratic process works, is that we're giving you a way out, but that's the way out that's in the fundamental law of the country the Constitution. You can't invent that, you know, there has to be enabling legislation or a trial or any of that because it's a qualification now to be a federal officer. And I think it's a minimal qualification that you have not committed treason against the United States government. Just a couple of things we ask of you. One of them, no treason. Um, I want to ask you a methodological question because it's very striking to me reading the historian's briefs in this case that the methodology, the historical methodology that you and your colleagues deploy is quite different from what Justice Alito was doing in Dobbs or what Justice Clarence Thomas was doing in Brew in the gun case. They have this notion that when we do history – We don't do actually the notes and the debates and what was said in the debates and what makes it into the text of the law. They want to do original public meaning, which means finding in old bookstores dictionaries. And I find it really striking because I don't know that we talk about it often enough. And I know this is a sort of a inside baseball Supreme Court 
question. But it doesn't look like what you are doing in your brief or what the other historians are doing in their brief is looking up words in dictionaries to determine what Americans thought insurrection meant or what Americans thought officers meant. You actually are very interested in what the drafters were trying to get at. And I just wanted to give you a minute to reflect on the weird mission creep in the Supreme Court's notion of originalism. That's a great question, you know, because I'm not an originalist, but I don't think they're true to the idea of originalism either. I mean, how do you define that doctrine? You don't do it by some esoteric definitions. You actually look at the historical records. If you want to be faithful to the founder's vision in 1787, right, if you want to be faithful to that, then read what they said. Read the debates of the Constitutional Convention, which were published, by the way, for the first time in the 1840s. And so immediately slaveholders, abolitionists, anti-slave politicians are reading that and say, what did the founders want? You know, look at the historical record. I think the problem with people like Alito and Thomas is to be deliberately ahistorical because the historical record doesn't support them. Even with the Second Amendment, I mean, the Heller decision is a decision from hell. You know, it was not the received wisdom. But I would also be careful with the kind of bad jurisprudence that the Supreme Court has piled up over the years and decades. And Reconstruction is a great example. I mean, to completely misread the 14th Amendment protections and use it for private corporations. You know, corporations are people. There were certain legal protections for corporations right from the start. But that goes on to overdrive after Reconstruction. It's a complete misreading of the 14th Amendment. So if you look at the Supreme Court decisions from the Slaughterhouse case to the Cruikshank case where they refused to uh, let people who committed racial massacres even be prosecuted, uh, to Plessy versus Ferguson, it's, it's mind-boggling how much damage they were able to do by simply misinterpreting or reinterpreting these amendments in very imaginative ways. So I don't think they were even true to originalism. You know, I would I would respect that. But I don't think they're being even true to that by erasing the historical record. We're going to take a quick break to hear from some of our sponsors on this week's show. And we're going to hear now from another great sponsor on our show, SAP. This episode is brought to you by SAP. First, the bad news. SAP Business AI won't help you generate cubist versions of your family's holiday photos, but it will help you understand which supplier is best to help you roll out your plant-based packaging in Southeast Asia, identify the training your junior project manager needs to rise up the ranks, and automate repetitive tasks while you focus on big innovations. So you can be ready for the next opportunity. Revolutionary technology, real-world results. That's SAP Business AI. Shipping can make or break a sale, so optimize how you ship your orders with ShipStation. They make it easy to automate and manage orders no matter how big your business grows. And they might even be able to help reduce shipping and warehouse costs. So optimize and keep up your momentum for growth with ShipStation. Sign up for your free 60-day trial now at ShipStation.com and use the code P-O-D. That's ShipStation.com with the code P-O-D. And now let's return to our conversation with Manisha Sinha on the well-documented history of the disqualification clause of the 14th Amendment. There's another historian's brief I referenced in my introduction. It actually cites to your work, and it makes it an argument that you, uh, the, the brief that you signed off on makes it, but it really kind of puts it on steroids. And it essentially says, this is not just a backward-looking enterprise, right? That the drafters of the 14th Amendment were not just trying to bench secessionists. They were not trying to just resolve the problem of the Civil War and Reconstruction. 
They were also staving off future insurrections. And one of the things in that brief I'm just going to quote says five years and 700,000 war deaths later, the framers of the 14th Amendment hope not only to prevent a resurgence of secessionism, but also to protect future generations against insurrectionism. An early draft of Section 3 uh, I read had limited the reach to those who had participated in the last insurrection, that's eliminated, right, in favor of language that says we're looking forward to. And it feels like it goes to the heart of the issue you're trying to raise, which is there's no question that the drafters of Section 3 were not just thinking about past insurrections. They were thinking what you were thinking on January 6, which is here we go again. Absolutely. You know, I think that brief and, you know, I'm a little naive because I'm a historian. I thought I could sign two briefs. (laughs) I was going to sign on to that brief, too. And then I realized that you can't sign two briefs for one case. Uh, But I think that brief is really quite brilliant. Its main author, Jill Lepore, I think, has done a wonderful job just excavating the historical reasoning for the 14th Amendment. And if you look at the debates in the Congressional Globe, which is what it was called, the magazine that literally reprinted everything that people said in Congress, and it's available online, your listeners, if they're really interested, can go back and read those debates. But that brief so well looks at those Congressional Globe, and it's clear in those debates that it's not a short-term stopgap solution to the crisis that they are facing, which is the major crisis of the union until that point. A civil war, a huge insurrection, and a war that lasted for four years. That they are, in fact, thinking about the future of American democracy. Because when you write a constitution and you write a fundamental law of a country or that you amend it, it's not like a federal law that you are passing to meet the exigencies of the moment. You are writing a part of a document that you hope will be the founding document of the republic for ages to come. And the people who wrote it are very well aware of that. So the Equal Rights Protection Clause, they actually say this in Congress. They say, who knows what rights may arise in the future that this clause might cover? So when the gay marriage issue came up, you could actually go back to somebody in the 19th century saying that we are not aware of rights that might come up, but we are going to use the broadest egalitarian language so that no group of American citizens will ever suffer any disability for any reason, that there'll be a national standard, right? Same thing with Section 3. They were quite aware that even though the Confederates had been defeated, that they had not accepted defeat. There were daily reports of racial massacres coming from the South, that the South was not reconciled. And the North was getting tired of what they call these annual outrages. They didn't have the political will to occupy the South or to deconfederatize, if I can even invent a word, the way you have denazification in Germany after the Second World War. They don't have the political will or the military will to do it. So the 14th Amendment is supposed to take care of that, right? And it is supposed to visualize the future. Uh, And I think that brief got it just right because it's so deeply based on what the originators of the 14th Amendment said, how it was debated, what were, as you mentioned, things that they did away with and things that they kept for deliberate reasons. You know, when you amend the Constitution, it's no joke, right? You need to get two-thirds of the Congress, you need to get three-fourths of the states, and you have to make sure that you are writing it in a way that it is permanent and that the only way to change it would be another amendment. So that brief was was really acute in making that point. So so I have one last question, and I'm going to preface it with the confession that I just straight up lied in my introduction when I said that I wanted to kind of bracket the kind of strategic and deeply political questions about, you know, from a lot of of the folks who are saying this is not a good idea and they're saying it because they're afraid it's going to foment, you know, more dissatisfaction, more violence, that it's going to, you know, construct a world in which Trump supporters can say, oh, I, now I really am disenfranchised, right? I, I have a guy and he may or may not have insurrected, but I would like to vote for him. And um, 
you know, I think Jonathan Chait, uh, the journalist, has has said, quote, to disqualify Trump would be to seen forever by tens of millions uh, of Americans as a negation of democracy, right? So that's the the political slash pragmatic argument against invoking Section 3 next week at the court. And I want to give you a chance, again, as a historian, to answer what is just a purely, you know, it's 2024, and this seems crazy. And as you said, we haven't experimented a whole lot with Section 3 post-Civil War. What does history tell us about what happens when you poke the bear? What happens when you call people insurrectionists? What happens when you actually say, no, you are not fit to serve? So this is uh, an argument that's being made by a lot of people who see themselves as moderates, you know, in the mainstream. Liberals and even, Liberals right? even. And they don't want to do anything that will antagonize Trump's supporters. What is more dangerous, I think, in my opinion, is in a two-party system to have one party completely hostage to those ideas. And the question then becomes, as Chait puts it, of democracy. But I would ask Chait to listen to the one mainstream, moderate, anti-slavery politician from the 19th century. Not an abolitionist, but a mainstream, moderate, anti-slavery politician. Abraham Lincoln. Now, before Lincoln became president, there was this idea, there was a controversy that actually led to the Civil War, which was the expansion of slavery into Western territories, which was really indigenous nation territories. They were just visualizing that they would just dispossess them. But the controversy was not over abolition. It was over the expansion of slavery into these territories. And the Democratic Party, the Northern Democrats, the Southerners, of course, were like, slavery should expand everywhere. We should conquer Central America, Cuba. I mean, they had these grandiose pro-slavery imperialist visions. But Northern Democrats like Stephen Douglas in the Lincoln-Douglas debates says, let, let the settlers decide. Let the white settlers decide. They can vote slavery up or down. That's the democratic solution. That's what he called popular sovereignty. And Lincoln is amazing. He says, that's not democracy. That's autocracy. The federal government should prohibit the expansion of slavery. It's a moral wrong. It should never be put to vote up or down. Similarly, I think for somebody as dangerous and authoritarian who says, when I'm elected president, I will basically dismantle our constitutional republic. I will weaponize the federal government. I will deport people who are even citizens. Take him at his word. I think this is why we have a constitutional democracy. You can put certain things to vote. You can put certain people up on the ballot, but they have to meet certain qualifications. And I think in a country based on the rule of law, in a country based on basic ideas of citizenship rights, of human rights, of not allowing a really bad actor to take office. We need to be aware of this. And I would say to everyone to listen to Lincoln's uh, Lyceum speech from 1838 when he warned that a bad actor or tyrant could take advantage. And that's when the rule of law should trump any pretended exercise in voting on democracy. And in this particular case, I really think people have gotten it wrong. They're afraid of the political violence that Trump's disqualification might incite. I am afraid of the political violence that he would unleash and then also use the instruments of state to do that. And then you are in a position where in a position of no return. Yeah, I don't think uh, disqualifying someone. I mean, I can't run for the presidency. I wasn't born in the United States, and I accept that. Let's say, you know, a majority of Americans want to vote for me as president of the United States. Are they then being deprived of their democratic right to vote for me? No, they're not, because it's very clear in the Constitution. You have to be born in this country. You have to be 35 years of age. And according to the 14th Amendment, not incited an insurrection against the United States government. To say that January 6th was protest is makes no sense 
if you are actually trying to disrupt the functioning of the United States government and a very important part of it, which is an election process. You are storming the Capitol to disrupt the... Pro- You're not just standing outside and protesting and saying, oh, the election was stolen. Well, you can certainly say that. You're misguided. You're wrong. But you have the right to say that. But if you are storming the Capitol and doing kind of barbaric stuff there, you know, then yes, you know, you you are held liable for trying. And you, you know, have congressmen fleeing the Capitol. You know, that, that was shocking to me. And the vice president... And the vice sc- president... Sc- scuttled out like a... Yeah. They wanted to hang him. Manisha Sinha is the James L. and Shirley A. Draper Chair in American History at the University of Connecticut. She's the president-elect of the Society for Historians of the Early American Republic. She is one of the signatories of a historian's brief in the disqualification clause case and would have been a signatory on both. Manisha, I cannot thank you enough. It really feels like this is a place in which history tells us what the future holds, and it really, really helps immensely to understand the history it is that we're trying to reckon with. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Dahlia. I'm biased, but history does matter. And that is a wrap for this episode of Amicus. Thank you so much for listening in, and thank you so very much for your letters and for your questions. You can always keep in touch at amicus at slate.com, or you can find us at facebook.com slash amicus podcast. Sarah Birmingham is Amicus's senior producer. Our producer is Patrick Fort. Alicia Montgomery is vice president of audio at Slate. Susan Matthews is Slate's executive editor. And Ben Richmond is our senior director of operations. Merritt Jacob helped us put this show together. We'll be back with another episode of Amicus next week. Until then, hang on in there. At Arizona State University, we've made online education better, smarter, and more personalized so you can go further in your aspiring field. I decided to pursue medicine once I realized that ASU did have the online program for biological sciences. You're still required to learn the same curriculum. You're still being tested on the same content that anyone would be tested on in person. The comprehensiveness of the program prepared me so well for medical school. Explore over 300 programs at asuonline.asu.edu. Hey, this is Mary Harris, host of Slate's daily news podcast, What Next? Slate's mission has always been to cut through the noise, boldly and provocatively. This election season and Supreme Court term are no different. Important coverage like this, though, it would not be possible without the support of our Slate Plus members. So I'm going to invite you to join us with a special offer. You can try your first three months for only 15 bucks. That is five bucks a month for your first three months of uninterrupted ad-free listening on every Slate podcast, member-exclusive episodes and segments of your favorite shows like Amicus and the Political Gap Fest, and unlimited reading on the Slate site. Best of all, you'll be supporting all of Slate's independent journalism and analysis as we make sense of the news like no one else can. Sign up for Slate Plus at slate.com slash podcasts plus. Again, that is three months for only 15 bucks. So sign up now at slate.com slash podcast plus.